Let's start the show by talking about my sponsor, Paloma Verde, and their new website, PalomaVerdeCBD.com. Head over to PalomaVerdeCBD.com and check them out for all of your CBD needs. They've got the gummies, tinctures, the salves. So if you're needing anything to maybe chill you out, something to help you get mellowed out, something for your joint pain and stiffness, go over to PalomaVerdeCBD.com and give them a check out. Carlos and Vanessa are awesome people. They run a great company. And if you enter the promo code FACTS at checkout, you'll get 25% off your order. Plus, any order over $75, you get free shipping. So, I don't know what you're waiting for. Head over to PalomaVerdeCBD.com and check them out. Let's start the show. This episode will be completely taken out of context. Welcome to the Fact Check This Podcast. All right, back check this podcast, and today I've got a rebel scum, rebel scum Han. I knew I was going to screw that up. I ran it through my head like three times. And a, a fun thing about this, I, I should have kept all of the outtakes. Uh, I used to do a whole lot of solo episodes, and it would take me four tries to get the intro right every single time. Like it, just me sitting in a room by myself doing my own intro, and I would screw it up every time although with that being said mark claire is infinitely worse like doing the video editing and stuff for the lions of liberty he's terrible at anything solo like if he's left to his own devices he will he, he will screw it up 20 times and record the whole thing and then i get to just sit and watch it and laugh it's wonderful so so tell us a little bit about yourself and then we're going to get into some fun stuff today I think it's funny. I, I actually did start a solo podcast a, a while back, like, I don't know, a year-ish or so ago. And um, I started it because of what we decided to talk on, actually, is because of rabbit farming. And it wasn't like a rabbit farming podcast. It's just I had so many people asking me questions on it. I was like, I can't type all this out. So I'll just record myself answering all those questions about rabbit farming and put it up as an episode. But then I, I went to anchor.com and they're like, you need to have a name and you need to have this. And I'm like, I, I didn't expect to get this far. <laughs> like, you know, like I didn't plan on all this. So I, I did uh, like, I don't know, maybe like eight episodes by myself. And I'm like, I don't like doing this alone. It's, it's not a good time. <laughs> so I started doing one with my friend, Neil, um, for those of you who follow me as at rebel scum hand or Han, however you, I don't even, I don't even know what I want to call it. To be honest, it's a pun on my first name. So I don't care. <laughs> um, yeah, it's I do uh, with my friend Neil or also at Nevmec. Um, we have a Liberty podcast and we've kind of been slacking on lately just because we both have had a lot of life crap going on. Um, I will be starting another podcast in the relatively new future. I've had a lot of positive feedback, people asking me to dip into homeschooling. So I'll be doing that kind of crap later on. But today we're discussing rabbit farming because that's Something I actually have a lot of experience in, but I haven't been able to do for a little while, unfortunately. But I'm, that doesn't mean I lost all the knowledge. It just means I lost the rabbits. <laughs> so, And see, that sort of stuff is so. All right, I guess. So then do you do the uh, do you do the rabbit farming for meat or for like selling them like as pets? I, I used to do both. So when. So backstory, what happened, um, I was living with my mom when we first got started and my mom and I are both a little notorious for going, Ooh, baby animal, bring it home. And so That's long story bad. short, <laughs> long story short, she was at a flea market. She found a, the tiniest little baby bunny for 10 bucks. All she had on her was 10 bucks. She brought it home <laughs> and it, it was so little, like it was not ready to be weaned. We, I, it's a miracle we were even able to keep it alive because nursing rabbits by bottle feeding is actually incredibly difficult. And there's just not a formula out there that's as good as their mother's milk. So, but we did it. We raised this like two week old baby, bear, eyes barely open rabbit into a full grown rabbit. And then of course we're like, but what if we had more babies? And I found an ad on Craigslist for a female rabbit that needed to be rehomed for free. And I told my mom, like, you know, nudge, nudge. And she immediately got the rabbit. 
And so we had them together for several months and nothing, no babies. We're like, what the hell? We, I thought you were rabbits. Like I thought you breed like rabbits. And then all of a sudden there were bunnies, there were babies. And we're like, oh shit, there's babies. And then a month later, there were more babies. And then a month later, there were more babies. And we're like, oh shit, there it is. Like there, there's the, there's the phrase there. Yeah, and my mom said, true. yeah. And my mom said, no wonder people in other countries raise them for meat. And then she was like, what if I did that too? You know, we, we, we both have very little impulse control in that regard. So um, she looked into it and she did all this research and she's like, okay, I want to start meat rabbit farming. Now you got to understand here. I grew up kosher. I stopped being kosher. Like when I was about 17, 18 years old, as did my mother. But I had never had rabbit. Eating rabbit never crossed my mind. So I was like, what the, you know, I'm like, what, what are, what are you? And, <laughs> but my, at the time, husband, my, my now ex-husband, um, he was like, I really want to do this. So I'm like, okay, I'll look into it. I will agree to it as long as we make sure we choose a breed where nothing goes to waste. I don't want to disrespect the animal. I want to use all the parts I can. Not long before that, I took up sewing. So I'm like, okay, maybe I can use the rabbit pelts. You know, I can learn how to make rabbit for keychains and all that. And so I picked out my breeds and like, and I chose Rex. So in case people are wondering, ooh, what kind of breeds do you go with? Because that is one of the more popular questions. I chose Rex because they are an excellent universal breed. They do grow to be about eight and a half to about 14 pounds. And they're just a good meat to bone ratio. And their fur is really soft and plush. That is like a signature trait of Rex rabbits. The downside for raising them as meat rabbits is that they're really friendly. They're really sweet and social. So I can make it a little harder to kill them. Not going to lie. <laughs> but you get the meat though, and you get the pelts. So, you, you know, but so we did that and, um, we kind of just kept experimenting with different breeds to see what we would like. I really liked my Rex. Um, and I did sell them. I didn't sell them as meat. We, we kept them as meat for ourselves because we had nine people and three dogs in the house at the time. So, which not everybody ate the meat, but most of us did. And, um, if I kind of had a personal Stan were like, if they were really friendly, if they were extra social, extra loving, extra sweet, I would rehome them. I, I, I didn't have it in me to put them down. And then I did take on a breed that was specifically for pets. It's Velveteen Lops. They're like one of the best pet breeds out there. They're not an official breed yet. They're actually part Rex. They're just kind of a mix match of a bunch of breeds to create this new breed. So yeah, I was one the, actually the only breeder of Velveteen Lops in Arizona for a while. And um, like I had to go to New Mexico to get my rabbits. And, um, so I was selling those as pets and then I was selling Rex and other meat mutts as they're called for either pets or meat, depending on what people wanted. That's, that is, that is really cool. I, okay. So I grew up on a farm and have been hunting literally since I was big enough to carry my own gun. Uh, so I grew up eating rabbit, squirrel, deer, everything. And, uh, <laughs> My kids, since they were old enough to carry their own guns, they have also gone hunting and they like rabbit and squirrel and and deer and everything. And so like we we don't have any big problem with eating whatever. So that, that Yeah, is, that's good though. Yeah, and and <laughs> we also so we raise chickens and we have a couple goats. Um we we don't have meat goats there, the Nigerian dwarfs which for some reason around here are like super popular. So like we can, we have a, we have a good mix of different colors for the, uh, for the male and the female. Mm -hmm. So we should get some really pretty goats and we'll probably sell them because uh, I have threatened to, uh, I've threatened to turn them into mutton because they've <laughs> been getting into my blackberries. And uh, I, I have put a lot of effort into having a nice blackberry and raspberry bush. <laughs> And they've they've yep. made that challenging, but um, like we just we just ate a chicken over the weekend because it uh, it was getting unruly. And I was gonna say, was it an asshole? <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, that's been usually there. I've been there when you're just like, you know what, you're a little shit. You're going to the freezer. <laughs> that's usually the way it goes. The yep, yep. The, the first one that we ever had, we we've, we've been doing chickens for 
uh, four years now. And the first one that we ate, uh, it was a rooster and he had been friendly for a while. And then he just decided he wanted to be a dickhead. And every day, <laughs> every day when I'd go out to feed him, he would try to peck me when I'd go to get the feeder out. And one day he pecked me and I, it was just the wrong day. And I grabbed him, <laughs> I grabbed him, snatched him up, broke his neck, set him off to the side. And then I finished feeding the chickens. Well, I didn't realize the kids were watching me out the window. And so, <laughs> so I come walking into the carport carrying this chicken. They're like, they they open the door. They're like, did you just kill that chicken? I was like, yeah. And they're like, can we see? I was like, okay. So my That's step, my, kids. <laughs> my stepdaughter comes running outside, and I had set the, I had a little table in the carport at the time, and so I set it down on the table so they could come look at it. Well, as soon as she gets out the door, it jumps up, like neck hanging over, broke, jumps down off the table and takes off running out of the carport. So then I gotta go chase this thing down and catch it, and she's like mortified because like its head was just. Oh hanging my god! Out. So, yeah, so we've had some crazy, crazy times with the chickens, uh, but. You know. I used to help my brother raise his chickens. So yeah, been there to quail. So like we basically, um, he had a massive fenced in area. That's where he kept a lot of his chickens. After I moved back in with them, um, he got into ducks. He got into muscovy, muscovy. We got into quail together. And so I was out there often helping him out. And every now and then he'd help with the rabbits a little bit. I actually had to help him cull his first well, animal in general. And oh my God, like it was, so he had a quail and it laid an egg, but it prolapsed and it was like, it lay like in the middle of the night. So it was all dried and there was like no way, like the egg was stuck. There was no way saving this poor thing. Right. And so my brother calls my mom, like, I don't know what to do. We have been trying to save it and trying to remove it. I've looked up how to fix the prolapse vent, but it's stuck. And no matter how much I moisturize it, it's not going to be done. Like, he's like freaking out and my mom calls me she hangs up with him she calls me and goes you're gonna have to help your brother put this down and I'm like okay she's like you don't have to do the work he's got a man up he's gotta learn how to do it himself you need just just walk him through it I'm like okay so I go out there and we used to use the rebar method so we would take a rebar and put it like on their neck back of their neck you know like between the, their heads and kind of step down with your feet on the rebar and you grab the back of their feet and you just, you know, snap their necks real quick. So I told him that's what to do. I'm like, don't go too hard though. It's a little old quail. You don't need to do it too hard, but if that's the method I know, if you don't want to decapitate, then do that. He ripped the head right off, <laughs> like blood spraying. It's all on his face. He just turned around and just looked at me emotionless, just like, I just stood there. <laughs> I'm like, you earned a man card today, Sam. You did good. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had some adventures with poultry and whatnot. God, the first rabbit though, the first rabbit I helped put down, it was same day. So my mom and I went in together on um, a Dargent and this is like an, one of the more expensive breeds of rabbit, like, you know, good bone and meat ratio, beautiful fur, blah, 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 blah. And so we went half and half on her and we purchased for her to already have been bred. So like she gets to us pregnant. She popped out like two babies and they, she wouldn't feed them. They died. And we're like, okay, second litter. She stressed out. I mean, she was an antisocial little thing too. So we're like, you know, we'll try again. So she had another litter and she immediately tried to kill them. I mean, she's like flipping the nest box, stomping them like really bad. And we spent like three weeks trying to nurse these babies to help because she refused to feed them. They didn't make it. So we're like, you know what? We'll try one more time. And we go out there, we try to grab her to breed her and she's just napping. And we're like, you know what? Fuck you. <laughs> just You're done. And so that was the most saddest. That was like, that was the kill that changed me. It was like, you know what? I, I feel less bad now. Like I, I'm not, I'm not looking at this like, oh, cute little bunny. I care. No, nope, fuck you. You're going in the pocket. It, sometimes, <laughs> uh, uh, like I said, like, the the rooster that i had to put down like he had been he had been fine he would run up and he was friendly initially and then he just started to turn and the more he turned the worse it got till it yep. like finally got to the point that like i wasn't going to put up with it anymore and mm -hmm. and it was really funny uh because you know the chickens are pretty social like 
uh, the ones we have now, they're really tight. Uh, one of them has a broken leg and oh. another one was, uh, was extremely small, like very, very runty. And, yeah. And so when the one had the broke leg, we put her and the runt together in a cage to keep them separated that way they wouldn't get you know trampled by the other ones right and so so now we have them out in the yard and those two just stick together all the time like they they are best of friends and they do everything like everywhere they go in the yard they go together even though you know the one is she's grown up and she's not a, a run anymore and the one with the broke leg can she can get around decently but yeah like she's She's not racing across the yard, but she can get she gets around fine, even though she still has the and the deformed leg. Um, but like they stay together and they stick with the goats a lot. Like the two of them stay close to the goats all the time, which is really funny. And then the other the other ones, they all just run in a pack all through the yard and like they travel. So they're very social animals. So yeah. like with that rooster, when when he got to being unruly. It was not just him pecking at me, but he was causing a lot of uh, stress for all of the other chickens in in the pen. And after I killed him, it was like night and day difference. Like all of the all of the other chickens were so much happier, and yep. they were more uh, they were more active and more like talkative and uh, chatty, and like it was it was a net gain by getting rid of the you yeah. Know, we had pain, similar, yeah. we had a similar experience. There was this one rooster. Um, he was, he used to be fine. Didn't really have any problems. And I would go out to the chicken yard with my kids who at the time were like two and three and they would just go collect eggs. They go say hi to the chickens. My, my daughter by then learned how to pick them up and hold them properly. So she'd go catch one, you know, and all of a sudden this rooster would just, he would kind of, you know, sometimes he'd peck and I was like, why are you, why are you pecking? What are you doing? And then he would go after me and he would like, kind of get a little but he left the kids alone so it was like okay he doesn't like me I guess no one day I hear screaming and that rooster just went after my son by the back like behind knocked him face first in the ground started pecking the back of his head so I just took off my shoe and chucked it at that bastard I went around chasing it picking up everything just chucking at it and I went and I, I got my kids out and I'm like Sam I beat the shit out of your chicken and he's like what do you do and I told him he's like that's fine. <laughs> it's all good. And yeah, so then he, he took the rooster and he separated him. He's like, I'm going to see if I can get him to calm down a little bit. And he spent like a month trying to get this rooster to chill, chill the fuck out. And he just wouldn't do it. And then it was like, all right, screw it. Why are we feeding you? And I think that's the only rooster. He didn't really raise them for meat. He just kind of kept them for pets and eggs. So he didn't like putting them down. If it one died, he'd cremate it, <laughs> you know? So yeah, it's kind of a softie, but say, um, we, we try to avoid having roosters. We, um, but like even with uh even when you buy the pullets that are supposed to be all female every mm -hmm. once in a while you get one of these little fuckers in there and yep they're <laughs> same with they're bunnies kind of, they're kind of handy to keep around uh because they will so sort of be protective of the rest of the flock and like they all yeah they uh we had a we had a problem with owls a couple years ago somehow owls kept getting into the pen and like mm -hmm. we lost all but we lost all but one and I've still got her. She's, she's super friendly. She lets, she lets my daughter just walk up and pick her up. <laughs> like Aww. she just sits there. And, uh, but we've had to, we've had to put her back in the pen because she decided, uh, she decided she wanted to just uproot everything in the garden this year. Like she went through and just started pulling stuff up out of the ground. So it's like, okay, you know, while we've got the garden going, you've got to go live in your pen. Like, we'll, yep once we get done with the garden and we've got everything uh pulled out and tilled up we'll i'll probably let her back out but for now while we've got the garden going she's got to stay put up and uh but she's super friendly like she she just happened to be the only one that survived the yeah owl massacre which was crazy because they hawks were our problem yeah it, and it was funny we didn't have a problem with the owls until i had to kill one of the roosters or the the rooster like well, um, mm. the rooster had started, he started getting real aggressive and, uh, it was a similar deal. Like he was bullying all the, all the hens. And so I was like, okay, you gotta go. So I killed him. And then after that, uh, like seriously, within a couple of weeks, that was when we started having problems with the owls. So 
I don't, yeah, I don't know. There is yeah, some benefit to, there is some benefit to having a, a rooster around, even if, uh, even if you're not trying to, to raise chickens and, you know, if you're just, Oh, absolutely. Them. Yeah. My, uh, my brother, before I came back out there, cause they started the chickens before I was there. Um, they had that issue with hawks one day they went out there and yeah, there was just a massacre. They were just killed for sport. I mean, there, there was, there were very few survivors. And so, uh, they would try everything from like the roof, like tape and you know, the, the fake owl statues and all that crap, nothing was working. I mean, like I've, I've witnessed them getting into the chicken coop and just like, it, it was bad. So this is a kidding not, this is the one thing I freaking work. It's going to sound absolutely absurd, but it worked. So I'm out there, hawks are circling above. My brothers go out there and they're clapping and they're yelling. They're trying to make noise and scare it off. And it's not doing anything. So I'm like, all right. And I stand there. I release just this pteranodon shriek, like just this massive, like from at, like from like the bottom of my soul to shriek. And that hawk, I kid you not, was like, oh God. And like, kind of like lost its bat, like it flipped out, flew off, right? Next day it comes back with more hawks. And I'm like, oh bitch, no. So I go out there and I do it again. And they all were like, oh shit, oh shit. They all flew away. It's been about six years. <laughs> there has never been a hawk problem again. <laughs> I kidding not. It's like, it's like like I put the fear of their god in them that day and they just took off. Like their hawk god. I don't even know. But well, yeah. <laughs> They evolved what? from they evolved from velociraptors, so it, right no, they're like, oh shit, that's our ancestors, and they just took off. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned the goat colors. That's actually one of the reasons why I chose Rex because Rex had the biggest variety in colors as well. So you know, to me, that was like, hey, more pelt variety for my for my bags and whatnot. Which, oh my god, processing your pelts in a desert is like the worst thing on earth. It's so horrible. It's so difficult. It dries. It's either going to rot in like a day, no matter what you put in there, or it's just going to dry out way too fast. You can only really do this in the winter where you have like an eight week span to get them all done. And then you're like stashing all your pelts in the freezer for like almost a whole year. And you're just trying to pump out all these, but it's not, it's not a good time. <laughs> so how much how much space do you need and like what kind of a what kind of a setup did you use for keeping them like there was a guy that that uh raised rabbits where i'm from when i was a kid and but he just had like the like the stand up hutches and mm -hmm. like kept them in that do you do something similar to that and like how much room do you do you kind of need are uh, we kind of evolved over time you know um we had some cages that were like handmade specifically for like moms and babies. So they had lots of room. Um, we usually kept our girls in elevated cages on T posts to keep them safe from predators. You know, cause we, out here, I mean, I live rural desert. So there's snakes, there's lizards, there's all the road, there's rats, there's all kinds of things that can get the babies. So we would keep them elevated. Um, we did have a colony area, technically two. We had one that was all female. And we had um, one, well, we put our males in with the chickens actually. And normally people will say, don't put the males together, but I little kind of humble brag. I have a knack for raising really sweet, friendly rabbits. My males never fought. Like they just did not fight. And I mean, same with the girls. They say never put all girls in your colony because they will actually fight each other. But they'll actually kick each other in the organs to make the other girls infertile. So only their lines will continue. Never had that problem. Never had that. Like they were all just chill. They would just cuddle and like all was good. The only thing though, and you mentioned the sex, the sex change problem there going on. You think you have all girls and then you don't. I swear there, a lot of breeders suspect that rabbits can change their gender if they are kept in an all other, like same gender area. And I might have been victim of that. I don't know for sure. There's no science to back it up but um jurassic Park. I, yeah. no okay story time so this happened to me i bought I, I was in kingman at a rabbit show buying a rabbit from a very reputable breeder had her pedigreed had her checked definitely seemed to be a young girl right 
she was the sweetest damn thing. I loved her. And, you know, you always want to check, you know, or they hate it, but you got to check because sometimes people get it wrong, but it, she's consistently seemed to be a female. She started growing a dewlap. For those who don't know what that means, the girls will grow like, like a giant double chin so they can grab fur and build a nest. She, males don't typically do that unless they're just a really obese. She had that. So I'm like, okay, girl, one day I got to my colony and there's babies everywhere. And I'm like, what the hell? Like there should not be babies. What's going on here? So I'm like thinking, okay, let me check the girls. You know, maybe I'll see some like blood on them or something. And I'm flipping them over and looking and I flip this girl over and I'm like, those are balls. Where did those come from? What the hell? <laughs> and yeah. So I changed her name to gold bloom that day because Jurassic park and it seemed fitting because she was a Rex. So Rex, dinosaur, Jurassic, you know, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Right? It was very perfect. <laughs> okay, so okay, so this this legitimately interests me because like I said, I got rabbit or I've got uh chickens, goats. I actually have a couple ferrets. I don't have breeding ferrets, they're just unfortunately. I, I really wish, but I don't think my wife would have allowed that. <laughs> uh, I've just got my those are my babies, and the kids <laughs> say that I love them more than I do them. Or the I love my ferrets more than I love my children. And they're not entirely wrong. The ferrets, are, <laughs> the ferrets are nicer and more. Oh, they're agreeable. fluffy. Yeah, they got those cute little little noses. Like, as, you know. as I say, I can bring them up here, and they will just run and play, and <laughs> they'll climb up my leg and get in my lap. If I bring the kids in here and do the same thing, they're just annoying and complaining. <laughs> Obviously, there's a you know, there's clearly a better choice here. So <laughs> I don't understand why the kids are so jealous, but whatever. <laughs> but we've also got guinea pigs we used to have a rabbit and uh we when we got the goat the first goat we decided to let the chickens and the goat and every like we fenced everything up and kind of got it all set up and we decided they're just all going to be free range like we've set up an area for them where they've got a place for their food they've got a place that they can sleep and be out of the weather like everything's set up we're just gonna let them all run loose in the yard and do their thing and so we put the rabbit out there with them and everything else was fine the rabbit disappeared immediately like i guess she got out from under the fence or something but we yeah the, we never saw her went. again uh, i and actually we, went oh go ahead go ahead i was like we've got a we've got a cat out there too and like mm. uh she she never messes with the chickens or any of the other animals like and she she comes and goes as she pleases like she'll i'll see her escape out through the fence and then She'll be back in a couple hours later. Like she know she knows where she's being fed. She's not <laughs> straying too far, uh, which also means we now have some kittens. Which, <laughs> of but, course. But yeah, we uh we had a rabbit, and and then she decided to to fly the coop on us. So, but I've had a couple do that. Um, I actually when we bought this house, we had this one. 14 pound Flemish giant mixed girl named Charlotte. And she was my first female. She hated breeding though. So I've only gotten like two litters out of her because she was just this strong, independent black girl who didn't need a man, I guess. And um, <laughs> she, when my ex's parents moved in, they left the back gate open and she got out. And to this day, you can see her living 20 miles away in the middle of one of the most scenic areas of Tucson in the wild with a chunk of your ear missing, but she's happy. So that's what matters, I guess. <laughs> it's been three years now, just about. <laughs> and she's living her best life. So good for her. That's it. So, uh, so do you, do you let them be somewhat free? Like other than the, when you have babies or I tried to, I always try to give them that, that area. Some of them I had to be careful with, um, just because some, some actually did not like the colony. Like they just didn't like being out in the open. They didn't like all the other rabbits. And so they just were happy. The very first rabbit I told you about, his name was Green Bean. Um, he was an example of that. He hated living out. He liked, so he actually had his own big fancy smanchy hutch that he had all to himself until a lady came along and then he was wooing them and whatnot. But, you know, yeah, he had his own little area and he was the sweetest damn thing. He was so cute. And um, funny enough about him, actually, this is one of the reasons why I got to develop a teen lops, the pet breed that I mentioned before. 
He turned out to be a plush slop, which is very similar. The difference is the type of lop they're bred with. He's a $350 rabbit that's mainly raised in Canada. Oh, wow. And my mom got him at a Mexican flea market for 10 bucks somehow. <laughs> No. <laughs> like yeah right so um but yeah we did try to give them as much freedom as possible um some of them like i said they just didn't do well in it we actually had one really sad case where um a breeder had a girl and she's like i just can't get her to breed she's really overweight and i can't give her the life she needs so she just gave her to us to see if we could so he's we stuck her in that colony this is early early on in our rabbit days. So we stuck her in there with like one other young girl and they got along instantly. They loved each other. Next day we go out there and the big girl's back is broken. And I can only assume it was because she was just so overweight. She got too excited. She just broke her back. So we had to put her down. And then we did an autopsy, found out she carried this freaking rare disease that caused infertility and obesity. So <laughs> we didn't, yeah. Rabbit, uh, rabbit deformities are not very uncommon. I mean, when you're pumping out so many babies, it's, you know, it seems like there's an issue, but in reality, they're pumping out between like five to 13. My, my record is I think 14 babies at once. So when you're doing that once a month, literally like once every month, month and a half, because they can actually get pregnant while they're in labor, just so everybody knows. <laughs> yeah. So imagine Imagine uh, how many babies, I mean, I tried not to breed them that often. I didn't like to breed them that often, but sometimes they got a little too daring and they'd go into, they dig into the males area and then, you know, they did what they wanted. So when you're just pumping out babies that often, you're going to occasionally have a deformity, you know? So we have, we've had a, our share of, I actually have a Cyclops newborn in my freezer. <laughs> Yeah, I've had I've had Cyclops. I've heard hermaphrodite rabbits are not uncommon. I've never had one. I have had a couple with two penises though. I yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I would want two penises. <laughs> right? No, my ex walks up and he's like, "All right. So here's his penis. And here's his other penis." And I'm like, "What?" <laughs> Excuse you. <laughs> so yeah, I've only had that twice, but yeah, that, that's a thing that happens. And usually you just want to put those down. You don't want to breed those into your lines. It's like, that's a very important part of rabbit breeding. Do not breed the bad genetics. So, yeah, that's. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I've that's important for any with, breeding, but. I say I always had a problem with, uh, like, because I, I, I've deer hunted, you know, since I was a kid. And guys won't want to shoot like the mangled ugly rack buck i'm like that's the one that you that's shoot. the one you go for yeah like yeah. call call that fucker out you right. bad bad racks breed more bad racks like you want to get rid of that sucker like and right. usually usually they're big because nobody wants to shoot them I'm like i will absolutely take that like i i had uh the first buck i ever shot was it was the ugliest seven point you've ever seen like it had one that was just all mangled and nasty and the other one was a uh, couple times going the wrong direction like it was it was hideous but it was a it was a massive buck I was like okay and you're like <laughs> I'm I'm taking this sucker this is some good meat and right which I, I mean that's the way I've always been I don't I don't trophy hunt I'm I'm hunting for meat like we're gonna we're gonna eat whatever we whatever I kill and, absolutely uh, and and yeah. so that I I have a buddy here who he actually does breed and raise meat goats uh i'm trying to remember what it is it's it's a like a bigger body breed uh mm -hmm. specifically for meat and i wouldn't mind getting into that but i just don't have the room for it but like rabbits yeah. would be rabbits would be something that i could do um because we do have enough what i worry about is i do have a nice garden and if i tried to let them roam free they're they're probably not going to stay in the caged area very well they're they're probably going to be like uh our pain in the ass chicken hey hey that oh yeah thinks they need to tear everything up and so so she gets to go live in the live in her pen for a while mm -hmm. uh i worry that would be the that would be the problem that that was that was the problem we had early on with the goats was uh initially they stayed out of the garden but then once they figured out what was going on in the garden, there was no keeping them out. So we had to we had to move them and and refence everything off to to keep them away from from the garden. Because right, I put a lot of time and effort into the garden. I don't <laughs> want I don't want animals coming in and ruining it. 
you know? Yep. That's very fair. Absolutely. Yeah. We had um, this one girl that we used to just kind of, she just got out one day and she enjoyed it. So we're like, Oh, okay. You can be here, but she would absolutely go for the garden. So my stepdad used to just pull out handfuls of whatever and give those to her. And then she'd start leaving them alone. But if you have a bunch of rabbits, it's probably gonna be much harder to, to manage as opposed to just one little girl, you know? So what's a, what's like a good herd size for, for breeding rabbits? Like, like how many do you want to start off with breeding or do you mean like right. a litter size to start? Okay. Most yeah. people start with a trio. Um, they'll get, you know, one male, two females. I personally don't like to just stop at that. Sorry. I'm having like air on my stuffing here. Um, I, I personally don't like to just kind of stop at that. I like to have like three girls, two males, just because rabbits are very unpredictable and they can have health issues that you'll never know about. And so if one's dead, then what? Now you got to buy another rabbit. And I mean, it's happened where sellers have accidentally sold me sick rabbits and they didn't know, you know, like everything seemed fine. I mean, they would send me photos, everything looked fine. And then there, there was just, you know, some kind of kidney disease or something going on. And they had, they had no way of knowing, you know, so it's not the breeder's fault. It's they just had no way. So yeah, that's my, but that's my personal preference. Everyone's completely different. Um, but I would say, yeah, at least, at least two girls in a male, just for the basics. And in my situation, I started off with two males and one, and one female, but my mom had a female too. I only did that because the girl was selling the males as a couple, cause they were brothers and they were attached. And what I didn't know is that they were infertile. <laughs> so I had two males and they're trying and trying and trying and nothing's happening. And yeah, she's like, oh yeah, her dad actually, or her dad, their dad did have some, some fertility issues. I'm like, well, gee, thanks for telling me that. Like, God, like you, I could have known that sooner. And, um, so later we got more males, you know, and then we had better times. Yeah. You just don't know what you're going to get. Unfortunately. I mean, people could tell you, oh yeah, it's proven they've had babies, but sometimes they lie or they just don't shoot that many they just got lucky one day you just never know hmm. same with the females you know i mean you can get a girl and if she might only pop out like two babies at once you know some just are not as fertile and then you're stuck with a girl popping two babies at once something happens a baby dies it's a run to get stepped on and suffocated and then what you know so as far as i'm concerned it's it's best to have a little extra just in case diverse diversify a bit yeah absolutely so are there any other particular like that that kind of gets me a good start for uh because I, I don't think my wife would be a particularly hard sell on this that's the whole reason we've got goats and chickens is because she uh has low impulse control when it comes to <laughs> cute animals so well, it's baby bunnies I mean like yeah <laughs> I will say another thing to consider because a lot of sellers will do this they'll be like oh yeah these girls produce like 12 babies per litter that's not necessarily a good thing um, because with more babies, with more competition for the milk supply. And so you'll get pretty mediocre sized rabbits more often. In fact, oftentimes what I used to do, because I used to have, a, I, had, I had over a hundred at one point, just because my mom could bring them home too. But uh, I, I would like kind of, I would try to sort of like breed my girls. I would like breed like two or three around the same time that way if something happened if one had too many if a mother died or something I could take the babies and give them to another mother mothers actually very happily will take care of other baby of, of other babies from other litters they don't they don't care so um I would if I had like a girl who birthed like 10 babies but then I had a girl who who birthed like three I would take some of those babies and give them to the other mother and just kind of even it out. And then they would just kind of grow a little bigger, a little healthier. Cause you want those babies to be fat little bastards. Like that's how, you know, if they're properly fed, you're going to be mortified. You look at them and they look like these veiny little balloons that are going to explode. And you're like afraid of touching them. Cause they look like they're going to pop. That's how they should look. If they don't look like that, that's not a good thing. And they're less likely to look like that if there's a lot of milk competition. So yeah, if somebody tries to say like, oh yeah, they make like 14 babies litter. That's, that's great. That's not great. <laughs> yeah, that makes, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I did, like I said, my record, I think was 14 and um, only two of that litter died. 
One was a tiny runt, knew it wasn't going to make it. One was by surprise. The others did really, really, really well. But um, the mother was also a massive, massive girl. And it was just, they, there wasn't as much of a struggle. She was eating constantly, able to produce milk. But that she was like the exception, honestly. That makes sense. Yeah. So, so is there any... And say, is there anything else that you get asked regularly that you wanted to address? Like, like I said, that that kind of that kind of uh, gives me my base for uh, for what I was curious about, especially with you know thinking about starting something like that. Uh, I, I want to uh, something that I've been big on most of my life, but especially here over the last couple of years is like. And it's probably just because I was raised on a farm where we had goats, we had hogs we had these big giant garden like we had a big giant garden at our house and my granddad had this big giant garden that he kept and we had just all kinds of food mm -hmm. that we raised and so you, like you never you never had to worry about if there was going to be food because we were going to raise the food and then, right you, know, uh, you would go to the grocery store for the stuff that you wanted, but the stuff that you needed, you always had enough of. And um, so, so that's been something I've really tried to work into is expanding our garden, growing our own food. And, and because I, I do deer hunt, but you know, it's a seasonal thing and you only get so many. And, and, uh, you know, in the event that things get crazy, uh, I need a more consistent supply of yep. meat and and uh, finding finding outlets for being able to do that myself because like uh my parents or and my my brother like they'll they'll buy a, a, a uh, they'll buy a hog or they'll buy a cow and have it slaughtered and stuff but you're still relying on somebody else for right that. Like, I, I don't want to I don't want to have to worry about if things get crazy uh is somebody gonna be like nope I can't do that because I gotta keep this for me like I want to have my own supply so you know that talking to the buddy of mine that does goats especially now that we've got a couple goats and thinking about that kind of thing and especially with with the setup we have rabbits would be much more feasible because we don't quite have the room for more goats uh, yeah the, the two we've got being miniature uh size that they have plenty of room, but if I started adding like full size meat goats, I I don't know where I'd put them. Like we would right. be they'd be walled up on top of each other out there. So uh, <laughs> rabbits would be a a good solution to that. And plus, I love oh rabbits. yeah, the rabbits delicious anyway. So <laughs> yeah, uh, is there anything else that I uh, like questions and stuff that you you've gotten that you wanted to address specifically? I'm trying to think because I covered. But a pain in the ass it is. I mean, I guess some people ask me like, "How does the butchering process go?" So if anybody's want like considering this, and you know, oh, I'm kind of squeamish. I can't handle the blood. Blah blah blah. Okay, I'm not gonna lie. One of the reasons that I was like, "Okay, I'll give this a shot," was because I watched videos on how to process and cull these rabbits, and I was like completely blown away by how not messy it was. I was like, I was stunned. Like. With a chicken, I mean, I'm sure you know, like with a chicken, you're plucking it, you're draining it, like it, it's no, no, not it a good time. Don't don't yeah. do all that. It's a lot. So let, let me tell you the trick to the chicken. Okay, because I don't have a lot of experience butchering chickens. I just have experience catching and raising and hatching okay, them. Me, so I'm going to tell you the trick to the chicken. And okay. anybody who's listening to this is getting the, the chicken trick. Because so the reason you pluck and all that stuff is to preserve the skin. but the skin is number one. It's like the least healthy part of the chicken. And like for me, I like the skin. Yeah, I like the skin. <laughs> you know, especially if it's fried. But oh god, us usually whenever we, uh, whenever we cook one, we either do it in the smoker, we'll broil it. Like we, I'm never frying these things. And yeah. so the skin is for one. The skin is the least healthy part, and it's the most annoying part when you're trying to dress a chicken. So what you do is you get the at the rib cage, you get right at the bottom of the rib cage and you run a knife just straight up that rib cage, peel that skin off, takes all the feathers and everything. All the meat is preserved. You don't have to deal with that shit. It's, well, shit. <laughs> makes it infinitely easier. Uh, 
granted, like I said, like <laughs> you don't keep the skin, but uh, you're keeping your time, your right. sanity. <laughs> it's it's a lot easier to. to yeah, rabbits are the things. same way. Rabbits are the same way. Like I watched this video, this one guy, and he's like just talking and just ripping. Like it took like three minutes per rabbit for him to like kill skin gut done. I mean, it was amazing, and I'm and I'm watching him like there's no blood. <laughs> like it's, it's not that bad. I was it's really blown not. away. Now what we used to do though, we used to have a what we called our culling station. And we would like slit their throats and let, and the blood just dumps. It's like three seconds and it's done. We would collect it all in a bucket, water it down, and then use it for our plants. And the difference between the plants that got the rabbit blood water and plants that didn't was just phenomenal. So yeah, people ask me about that. It's really not that messy. It's really not that bad. It's going to take you maybe 20 minutes or so for your first time. But when you get your groove going, it's really not that bad. And I guess the other question people often ask me is, how do I cook it? And, you know, because they get, you know, they hear like, you know, if you eat nothing but rabbit, you're going to starve yourself of other nutrients. Cause it's like, it's like sheer protein. It's nothing but protein. And so you can actually get sick off of eating nothing, eat nothing but rabbit. And, um, which yeah, I mean, you know, balance your diet out, but people ask too, how do you cook it? Because it has so little fat, it dries out. My personal method a lot of breeders will tell you, slather it in bacon and fry it, slather it and bake it, slow cook it. They say low and slow. I'm not going to lie. I don't find that to be a very reliable method. I think people just go LOL bacon and they roll with that, to be honest, because it's really not that. It's not even the bacon. It's just the grease. They're just slapping the grease on there and then they're cooking it and it's not doing anybody any favors. My method, and this never fails, slather that bitch in olive oil. I find for whatever reason, that seems to contain the moisture a lot better than bacon grease does. And I don't slow cook it. I turn it on high in a crock pot. And by the time I'm done, it's just falling off the bone. It's just moisture and amazing. So that's the way I'll usually, <clears throat> whenever I do rabbit is I'll, I'll skin it and gut it. And usually I like, I won't even cut them up. I'll just leave it whole and mm -hmm. uh, I'll cut an onion in half and stick it up in the rib cage. Put it in the crock pot with a little bit of just a little bit of barbecue sauce and some mm -hmm. uh, lemon juice uh yeah and just put it on high and let it go for a little bit until it's yes. nice and tender and that's delicious and yeah yeah that's my that's my never fail method i don't know everyone says low and slow bacon grease i'm like that i i it comes out okay but there's always dry bits you stick it and you put a little um chick something like that in there you know to just give it some steam you put lots of oil, olive oil on it. You put whatever seasonings you want on it and you high cook it for like, I mean, I, I don't really, it's two to three hours. I usually would go back and check. I'd take a four kind of poke at it and see what's going on, you know? But I, I swear that's my never fail method. So I'm going to, I'm going to end this on a horror story. Of a horror story. <laughs> that's the best if, way to end it. Since we're talking about uh, the actual slaughtering and skinning and stuff, so I took a AP biology class in high school and we were, we were going to dissect cats. And so, so the teacher was explaining all these, the way that you would like skin the cat and how you had to like peel the, peel the spots up and take the skin off and stuff. And I said, I said, it's basically built like a squirrel. And I said, you just pull the tail up, you cut it right around the base of the tail come around to the belly. I said, you just pull the top off like a jacket and you pull the bottom off like pants. And she looked at me like I was crazy. I was like, watch, I had the thing skinned in like four minutes. <laughs> and everybody else in the class is just sitting there staring at me like I'm some sort of a, like serial killer or something. I like, well, I mean, honestly, what's more psychotic? Knowing this kid knows how to hunt a squirrel, knowing people eat squirrels, or going, hey kids, we're going to skin cats today because that's totally something we do in our normal everyday life. Like, oh my God, here's just a shitload of dead cats, kids. Like, here you go, go to town because you're going to need this someday. Oh my God, is, am I wrong here? <laughs> I mean, it was AP biology. That's, that's yes, so weird. Yeah, cat, I don't know. That's so weird. Like, okay, we actually had to dissect frogs in first grade <laughs> of all times. In first fucking grade, they were, at, they were like, taking our hands with little scalpels and like carefully make a little rectangle flap and i'm just like i'm six what are you doing to me right <laughs> like i wasn't really that disturbed by the cons 
Okay, I wasn't grossed out by the innards. I wasn't bothered by that. Because I, I mean, I didn't hunt growing up, but I had a family of hunt, you know, hunters, you know, like, like everyone in my family hunted. Like, so it wasn't that weird to me. It was more just like, I'm six. Why are we doing this? I'm six years old, you know? So, so we, we actually, uh, a buddy of mine in the class and I actually took the, uh, the psychopath level to a, a different degree with our, our uh, cat dissection. He brought in a hacksaw and we <laughs> capped. I'll get the job done. You know, we brought, he brought in a ha- hacksaw and we capped the skull and took the brain out and then just walked around the, walked around the school and showed it to all of our teachers and stuff. And so like, we, yeah. we had way too much fun with this cat dissection. Like it's, it's supposed to be a learning experience, not a, uh, not a good, not a good time, but we, right. we definitely had fun with it. And no, yeah. I get a lot of looks because I, I mean, hell, I just had to catch a freaking pack rat last night and I'm on the phone with my friend. I'm like, yeah, I caught it. Cause it was my first rodent I've ever had in my damn house. And I caught it last night. And I'm like, yeah, I went out and buried it this morning. And he's like, I thought that was kind of cute. You're going to bury it until I realized it's going to, it was going to be because you're going to dig it up like two months from now and do some shit with his bones. I'm like, well, yeah, I'm like, going to let it go to waste. <laughs> it's art. <laughs> it's a gift. Right? That's awesome. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining me. This has been entertaining, if nothing else. And hopefully some other people will actually hear this and start thinking, yeah, I should definitely be trying to raise my own meat as well. You should. Well, go ahead and plug anything you got, and then we'll get out of here. All right. So, yeah, like you said, you know, Rebel Scum Hand, a lot of you guys, you know, probably probably follow me, but no, if not, that's cool. You don't have to. I'm not your dad. But, um, yeah, just follow me if you want to see a bunch of shit posts, but also some based shit every now and then. Um, I do have my own podcast. Like I said, it's called Red Letter, Yellow Letter. I don't know why I neglected to say that before, but that's what it's called. <laughs> um, some of you also know me as the Cryptid Bartender. And um, yeah, um, so some of you also know me now as Sprouts of Freedom, which is my upcoming homeschooling blog, podcast, etc. So I do way too much shit in my spare time, not gonna lie. But, um, and yeah, a lot of you also know me as the dick lamp lady that sells resin dick lamps and bone art and other things on Etsy. So I'm sorry, you just, you invited a hot mess over your show. Um, so yeah, I think that's everything I have to plug, I think. Awesome. awesome. Well, thank you very much for joining me. This has been a blast and we should definitely do this again because the homeschooling Absolutely. thing is also something that I would love to look more into. It's, uh, it's one of those things that, we are not currently in a position that we are able to do it, but it, I really want to get there soon. Like what state soon. do you live in, if I may uh, ask? Indiana. Okay. Okay. I was going to say, I don't know. There are some states I know the homeschool laws and shit too. Others I just don't. But um, it, it's, it's more of a, uh, it's a situation with the other parent, a, a different parent involved. That, gotcha. Uh, yep. It's I get not you. some. If it was just up to us, we would already be doing it, but uh, right, there right, are other right, other yeah. choices that have to be made and uh, opinions taken into consideration. So, yeah, but no, yeah, I we we definitely need to get back together and talk about that sometime in the future. So, Absolutely. thank you, thank Absolutely. you very much for coming on, and I look forward to doing this again. Absolutely, thank you so much. Have a good one. You too.